I'm Jeff Brabham, and this is The Skinny. From the Fatheads Eyewear Studios in Speedway, Indiana, this is The Skinny. Brought to you by Toyota, Rhino Classifieds, General Tire, and Dream Giveaway. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Toyota. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the beautiful studio here in Speedway, Indiana, just outside of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Ken Stat with you. This is The Skinny. Sitting right alongside is Mr. Michael Young. We call him the track dude. And mark my words whenever I tell you we're going to watch him make some little circles today. This is what Michael Young likes to do when he sets up a question. So <laughs> I've never, I've, you know, I, I spoke with Carl about this, and we'll introduce our guest in a second, but I, I find myself making circles when I try to come up with ideas. So I'm circling back around. I just figure that's what's going on in your brain. It's just spinning spinning little circles in there. and It's just spinning around, (laughs) folks. So we'll uh, we'll watch him make some little circles on the desk. In the meantime, we have Racing Royalty that has joined us here in the studio. While he's accomplished so many things in the world of motorsports, he is most noted for his four consecutive IMSA GTP championships. Uh, absolutely incredible run in, in that era of 1988 to 89, 90, and 91. He's won at Bathurst with his brother. He, uh, he had a number of starts in the kart world, has been in the Indianapolis 500. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Jeff Brabham, son of Sir Jack Brabham, the three-time Formula One champ and father of Matty Brabham, who has been on this show and couldn't have been happier to have him. Welcome, my friend. Well, thank you. It's uh, great to be here. I um, was listening to uh, you uh, doing the interview with my, with my son, and uh, I thought you, you and him did a great job. So hopefully I can live up to the same standard. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, we love Matty, and I know you and Michael were chatting about him a moment ago. Michael's very familiar with Matty, and uh, we certainly wish him the best. I I know, uh, at least behind the scenes, nothing's, uh, nothing's been officially announced yet, but hopefully we see him in open wheel racing here as soon as next year, as I believe some, some as they call it, silly season is, is in the midst of happening. So we wish him the best of luck. We know how difficult it is. Yeah, it's, you know, uh, everyone knows how hard it is, especially if you, you know, can't write out a check for $6 million. It, <laughs> it becomes really hard. But, uh, yeah, he's working on uh, something that hopefully uh, will be um, – Will will come to fruition um, shortly, and uh, yeah, it'd be great to see him back uh, on the dance floor, if you like. Because um, if you get off the dance floor uh, in motor racing, you get forgotten uh, really quickly. So it's important that you know at his stage that uh, we reboot, if you like, and uh, make another run at trying to get into IndyCar. Well, I certainly lived the same life with my son. I mean, Matty was able to keep his name in the game courtesy of Robbie Gordon's Stadium Super Truck Series and then also behind the wheel of the of the two-seater to at least keep his face in the paddock, if you will, and uh, talking with people, those relationships, as we know, are everything in our world because we can't write that check for $6 million. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it. I, I've said this to you. I've said it to Maddie. Um, wouldn't say it if I didn't believe it from the bottom of my heart, but when I watch your son drive, he is absolutely one of the smoothest I've ever seen behind the wheel. And, clearly has enough talent to uh, succeed given the right team and the right car. So we wish him the best yeah, of luck right. for sure. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. You talked about being on the dance floor and having Matt having to stay in there to keep himself in, in play for a ride. There, I did it right there. You see how I made that motion. Uh, <laughs> do you like to get back to the track at all? Do you spend a lot of time going to races still? How do you still find yourself in that big puzzle of autosport? Um, well, I haven't been going to um, professional races, like uh, watching Matt. I, I, I don't think I watched him at all, uh, went to any of his races this year or most of last year. But uh, I have been doing some historic racing in the last four years, and uh, I've been doing about uh, five or six races a year um, in that. So I've really enjoyed that because I actually – much more enjoy doing it myself than actually just hanging around, getting into someone's everyone's way, you know, to, at a racetrack. So uh, it's much uh, uh, it's difficult for me to go to a racetrack when Matt's not running at the level that you know I think he should be running at. So it's it's not necessarily that enjoyable for me. Uh, however, if he, for instance, got into IndyCar for sure, you know, I mean, my dream really when. When we made the decision uh, to come to the United States and um, 
with Matt, uh, you know, when he started the US F2000 series, my dream was that he was going to make it into Indy cars and I was going to drive the motor home to the track. And, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that's where I positioned myself. But we haven't quite got there yet, but we're, you know, we're still trying. <laughs> you talked about historic driving. What has been your favorite car to drive in a, in a historic race? <laughs> Well, I've only driven one, basically. So, um, I, funnily enough, um, uh, the SVRA series um, started a, a race here at Indy where they, uh, it was called the Pro Am race, where they had retired people like myself joining up with car owners of 1960s, you know, muscle cars and, and did a race. And the first race, I had to pull out of because unfortunately that was the year that my dad died and I had to go back uh, for his funeral. But the second year um, I, I was here and I, I did it and uh, I, drove, um, I drove in that. But during that event, um, they had a competition for the best looking uh, Brabham race car and um and i i was there so i gave the award and um anyway a, a, a guy called ron hornick won and i was as i was giving him the award i just happened to say um you know what i've actually never raced a brabham before you know I, i've driven a couple in a, in a demonstration lap or something like that, but i've never actually raced one this is oh you know, I've got a spare one. Maybe next year you can you can drive one. And I I said, well, uh, sure. But I didn't really think much of it. But he did actually get back to me, and uh, I did the next year. And that was the first. Well, I haven't hadn't driven anything for like eighteen years, you know. And um, uh, so uh, anyway, we struck up a friendship. And uh, he's got a couple of Brabham BT thirty fives, which is a nineteen seventy one. Uh, for Formula B car, and uh, he, um, yeah, he, he he enjoys having me around, and I help him out and coach him a little bit, and and we've just been having a blast. So uh, it's given me something to look forward to, and and, and uh, yeah, it's it's really fun. And then I raced against Matt at Coda last year because uh, Ron's got four of these cars, so he put Matt in one of the cars, and we we went head to head, and we had just had a great race. You know, he won, but that's okay. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, we're going to do it next week again as well. So, um, uh, we're looking forward to that. So, hopefully, this time I can I can beat him. <laughs> yeah, the so competitive I'm, spirit I'm still in there, <laughs> but I'm only dreaming. I, I, <laughs> Yeah. You know, you kind of took us back there uh, already, back talking about 1971. I'd love to hear your perspective of what it was like growing up with your father competing and being so successful in Formula One. What was it like as a kid to be around him in that era? Yeah, it's, a, it's a hard question to ask sometimes because people... You didn't really feel any different to anyone else because that's just what you did, you know. And um, when I wasn't at school, I used to go to all the F1 races, you know, uh, from probably when I was uh, 12 years old up to when my dad retired and I was 18 at that particular time. So I used to go all, all to all the races. And it, as you get older, I think you then start to appreciate that, hey, you are actually doing something different to what everyone else is doing. And it's a bit like, you know, you go back to school and someone says, oh, you know, what did you do this weekend? And it's like, well, I went to Belgium for the F1 Grand Prix. You know, so, or I went to Monaco, you know, and it's like, oh, OK. <laughs> and uh, but it was it was uh, looking back, it was it was extraordinary times, you know, because my dad had his own plane and we used to just jump in the plane and just fly to the racetracks and um, uh, in Europe, basically, obviously. And uh, I used to uh, do the timing and uh, just odd jobs around, you know, just to uh, be active and, and do something while at the, at the tracks. And um, yeah, it was it was just awesome experience and great fun. Did you guys actually fly back and forth from Australia to Europe for each oh, no. one of those races, or, or did he kind of stay in Europe during the season? Yeah, we. Uh, I went to England when I was four years old, and and just uh, we when he retired when I was eighteen, then we went back to Australia. But we were living in England the whole time. So, okay, yeah. cool stuff. Uh, we have Jeff Brabham in the studio with us. We're going to take a quick break here. We'll be right back on the other side. We have a ton of questions for this guy. Some cool stuff behind the scenes and very, very active as a driver.
This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Dream Giveaway. Dream Giveaway has been giving away high-end American muscle cars to raise money for charity since 2007. Dream Giveaway is known for giving away classic and new muscle and paying the federal taxes so the winners don't have to. For $25, you can jump in the game, and part of that goes to charity. You'll have a chance at winning some of the coolest cars on the planet. Check it out at dreamgiveaway.com. Once again, we welcome you back here to the skinny. We have Jeff Brabham in the house, the third Australian driver to win the 24 Hours of Le Mans, just one of the small accomplishments, if you want to call it that, that he has in his career. It's unbelievable what he's been able to accomplish. And, of course, his family, just deep in racing history. His father, the three-time Formula One champ. His brother's also competing. His son now competing. You guys are surrounded with it. And we don't want to forget the wife. Very, very competitive. We had Maddie in here, and he was talking about mom making him toe the line. Yeah, she she uh, raced jet skis for for years, and um, she was professionally racing in at the end of the of the nineties, and she was a factory sea do rider and came second in the uh, U.S. championships. But then she stopped, you know, because uh, she was, you know, I, I know she won't like me saying this, but she was in her early 40s and she was running against 18-year-olds and, and she still came second and won a race and, and she quit. Then four years ago, she came to me and says, oh, I want to go racing again. And I said, what? I said, you quit 18 years ago because you were too old. What's, you know, what's going on? <laughs> Did you, <know>? you get <laughs> younger? Yeah. Yeah. Did so you find anyway, a of youth? <laughs> funnily enough, we, we found the exact ski that she raced in 1998 here in the U.S. And, and we put it together and everything. And she went out and won her first race. And then we went to the World Finals in Havasu. And she came second. And, and she's running against guys. She's not running against girls or so she's in the in the guys race and she only got beat by some guy from thailand you know because it's a international you know world series and then since then we've been doing it it's a um you know she's she was this year she won probably 50 percent of her races and um, just having i'm just having a blast it's a hobby for me and it, it gets us out the house and she enjoys it so yeah it's, it's been great so so much fun <laughs> so we were talking about you traveling with your father, being with him as much as you possibly could when you weren't in school. When did the transition take place uh, from being with your father at the races to becoming a driver? Um, yeah, it, was, it wasn't easy for me because um, number one is in that era, there were very few, if any, second generation drivers. It really wasn't really the, uh, the, the accepted thing. And um, when I, uh, when we went back to Australia, um, I, I was still in school and I left school. We went back to Australia. And it, luckily for me, uh, my dad uh, started a, a Ford dealership in, in Australia and they were actually um, sponsoring a Formula Ford. And um, so I, you know, I, I said, you know, I, give me, I, I'd like to give it a go. But it took me probably, I don't know, nearly two years to, to convince him to to let me, you know, have a go because he wasn't, he wasn't for it at all. Um, but once I got in it and I started to, to show, you know, started to go reasonably well, then, then he sort of helped me as much as he could at that particular time. So, um, yeah, but it was, it was a bit of a struggle at first. Um, but um, I, I persevered and eventually he gave in. And, and uh, How old were you when this happened? Well, I, I didn't actually start racing until I was 21, you know, which in today's, world is probably 10 years too late <laughs> so. yeah well i mean and and we hear like bobby ray hall i don't think bobby ray hall really saw any success till near 30 so i mean it was pretty much common 21 yeah, might mean, have been I mean, kind people, of young back then i mean obviously back then people were, were older there was no question because mm -hmm. i i never did carts so karting really wasn't around you know uh, I wasn't even really aware of karting that much at all until um, too much later. So, you know, the first thing I ever drove was a Formula Ford. Was there a time that you remember? I, I always ask this question. I ask it of Graham Ray Hall, Marco Andretti, Michael Andretti, that you realized your father was something special, that he wasn't just dad to the rest of the world. He was a world champion. Was there a moment growing up? You, it had to have been different saying, oh, we just got back from – from Monaco, or, or you had to realize something was a little different with your family, even though it was your dad. Uh, yeah, I don't think it was. There was, wasn't one like watershed moment that you know the light bulb went off. It was just the older you get, 
the more you you got into it, and the more you appreciated, you know, what he was doing and and uh, how he was doing it, you know, because he was uh, different to other Formula One drivers, uh, at, you know, when when he was racing, because he was they were doing their own cars, and you know, where other Formula One drivers were off having dinner with journalists and and young ladies or whatever you know dad was back in the plane going back to england the night before a grand prix putting the engine uh, putting a cylinder head in my mum's oven uh, to try and you know fix whatever problem it has getting back uh, flying back that night and jumping in the car and doing a grand prix and he always said that you know uh, driving the actual race was his relax his relaxing time you know because up until that point he was working so hard he you know it was his his time to relax and enjoy himself so uh so that was different to you know at that time the jimmy clarks the stewarts the um you know sterling mosses uh, going back a little bit further you know obviously they they were acting you know, they, they were being the real race drivers where my dad was, his driving was a bit of a part-time thing to what he was, his main job was. You know. Was there ever an issue with kids that you went to school with that were Clark fans <laughs> or Stewart fans? Did you get in a scrap? Because this is my dad you're talking about here. <laughs> no, no. I, I, honestly, it's the first time everyone's asked me that, but another thing I can recall, no. <laughs> no it's, not, it's not like football teams. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, the real serious yeah. stuff, where, yeah. <laughs> So I'd love to transition because we'll quickly run out of time. This show just whizzes by and we have people like you on it. Um, but I want to transition into your actual driving career, driving for kart teams like Craco, Gallus, Penske, Menard, just to, to mention a few here. Ten starts in the Indianapolis 500, uh, a couple of those inside of the top five, I think career best of fourth place. Uh, not shabby by any stretch of the imagination. And then, of course, those IMSA GTP championships. And for the fans that aren't familiar, I would urge you to Google that and look at those cars. I mean, woo, those things to this day are straight up badass. That was the premier class in IMSA. And, uh, of course, you were driving a Nissan, and uh, the Nissans were known to come in uh, by, with you behind the wheel as the first car that was finally able to beat up on the Porsches, which had been dominating in, in that series and in that class up until that time. I'd love to hear about that car. Yeah, it was it was interesting because I was still running Indy cars and um, the engineer who I who helped me when I drove for Dan Gurney in the Eagle at Riverside in the in the um, California 500 in 1981. Uh, Trevor was the engineer then, so, and he went to Nissan, and uh, he rang, uh, rang me up and says, oh, look, our driver just got injured. You know, you interested in, in coming and driving for us? And um, I actually said no, because I actually saw that race he got injured in, and um, when, he, uh, the, when he crashed, the seat belts all came out, uh, uh, just um, you Pulled know, out, came apart, yeah. mm -hmm. and he he got out of the car with the seatbelt still on him, uh, and then he was on his hands and knees, you know, trying to get his breath back. You know, the car had a pretty bad reputation. Um, anyway, he he convinced me that um, you know at least come out and have a look. So I, I came out and had a look, and uh, I I was impressed by the people they had there, and I could tell that yes, they had problems. Uh, yes, they knew what the problems were and they were going to fix them. So I ended up uh, doing a race at the end of the year at Riverside. And uh, funnily enough, I did actually have something break, um, which caused a bit of a moment for me. But anyway, they they then uh, did their own, basically, to cut a long story short, they did their own chassis, their own aerodynamics. And in 1988, I joined them full time. And um, uh uh, IMSA had reduced the uh, turbocharge size, the inlet size, for that year. Um, the problem for IMSA was that yes, it, the cars weren't giving over a thousand horsepower anymore. They were they were like eight fifty, but it increased the torque so much we were like a couple of seconds faster anyway. So, it, um, you know, it, it didn't slow us down. They actually made us faster. You know, but the the great thing about it was, yeah, the Porsche thing was was interesting because the Porsche was at the end of their cycle and uh, they really weren't competitive with with the modern day you know car I actually, I actually drove a Porsche once in Japan and it's the only race car I've ever driven where you actually had a key to turn it on with <laughs> yes <laughs> which <laughs> kind of showed you where where they were at uh, but the great thing was Jaguar came over 
from England uh, with Tom Walkinshaw and and the rivalry that we built up and um, the, the tension or and as I said the rivalry between Jaguar and us was really intense and it, it really made made it fun for me you know and it made me because we generally beat them if we were if we were the other way around it probably wouldn't have been so much fun but uh yeah it was just a, a, a great period uh, you know we run the championship four years in a row but we we're on a bit of a, a downslide we won i think 11 races the first year 10 the next year then five and then we only won one race the last year but we we had reliability and we still won the championship and then the toyota's came in and kicked our ass uh, you know <laughs> the next year after that so we were at the shaggy end, will love to hear that yeah <laughs> so we we're, we're at the end of our cycle but uh it was a great time because the cars were awesome they're high downforce high horsepower and and in fact um uh, i think the the imsa cars now are only just starting to beat the lap times that we were doing back in the late 80s early 90s yeah We've got Jeff Brabham back behind the wheel now, and trust me, we're going to keep him there. Stay with us. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. This segment of The Skinny has been brought to you by General Tire. It's more than just a slogan. Anywhere is possible with General Tire. General Tire's Grabber X3 Mud Terrain Tire offers aggressive styling and is engineered for durability with innovative performance features that are ready to carry you through extreme mud, dirt, and rock-covered terrain for extreme traction that's ready for anything and rugged styling to match. Look no further than the Grabber X3. Make your anywhere possible by visiting GeneralTire.com today. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Rhino Classifieds. Tired of all those ads and random stuff that shows up when you're looking to buy or sell your car parts? Rhino Classifieds was created just for you. Welcome to a streamlined buying and selling app created by racers for racers and race fans. Modified cars, classic cars, race cars, that special big block you need. The trailer to move your baby around the country in. We got you at rhino.co. Once again, welcome back to The Skinny. We have Jeff Brabham in the studio with us today. Of course, uh, that name is nothing but royalty when it comes to motorsports. Great to have him spend a little bit of time with us. Uh, another one of the accomplishments, a couple of wins in IROC, which had to be super cool. We mentioned the win at Bathurst, did it with his brother, and inside of a BMW had to be another very special moment. And, uh, and also a couple of wins in V8 Supercars. Matter of fact, your first ever V8 Supercar race you grabbed a win. Only a couple of drivers have managed to do that. It's like, well, let's check that off the bucket list. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was it was a Sandown 500, so it was a, it was a long distance race, and uh, uh, had a, had a little bit of luck. Some of the, the more fancy regulars had problems, but yeah, it was it was great to win. A win's a win. Doesn't doesn't matter what. How, did, how what, special was it to, to win that Bathurst race with your brother? Yeah, it was pretty cool because um, you know I when I. Re left uh rich sort of stopped racing in the u.s i went back to australia and um i uh was driving um uh, the bmw two liter cars down there for a couple of years and uh the the big race in australia is like uh is the bathurst race bathurst 1000 which is 1000 k's um it's the sort of the indy 500 to australia uh and one year uh, normally it's a v8 race but there was some political stuff going on and and uh, the v8s didn't go so they ran it as a two liter race and uh, my brother had driven for bmw a little bit before uh for a couple of, a couple of years so he came out and was my teammate and um yeah we, we ended up winning the race which was which was really cool reminisce the first time you came to the indianapolis motor speedway growing up as a kid and actually coming to the facility for the first time what was that like for you yeah, it's pretty cool it's the first indy 500 i ever saw i was in it so <laughs> <laughs> that's wow. pretty cool yeah it was, so, it was, yeah, so wow. i didn't really know to what you know uh, but it was amazing it was 1981 and uh uh, I managed to. Uh, I think the first weekend got rained out, and I managed to qualify the first in the first uh, run, and so I was reasonably safe for the race, which which took a lot of pressure off, obviously. But the one thing I remember about that race more than anything else was sitting on the pit wall, 
um, at five o'clock on Sunday. And back then, the, the, the big teams used to run tea cars and they used to sell them. And so uh, back then it was pa- Patrick and uh, a few teams like that would have their tea cars. Just, I, I think, just pick a figure. Just say you had to do 200 to get into the race. So they'd put John Cock or wherever it was, Steve, uh, into the car. And they'd go out and run 203 put it back in line and then you've got these guys who are running 198 that's all they're going to do they're going to do 198 or they're going to crash and the car owners are going back with suitcases full of money and and uh trying to buy the t car to put their driver in and um it's just watching all this was just amazing and then you get some uh, it was mainly you know people out of sprint cars and, and at that particular time you get this guy who's never driven this car before, they jam him in the car with five minutes to go before the bell, strap him in, he's, he hardly fits, he's sitting in there. And, and I can remember looking in their eye, you know, I looked in their eyes and you could tell that they didn't care if they never came back, they were going to make the race, you know. And it was just, for me, having not grown up with that and, and not seen that before, I, I was just... Um, just godsmacked you know and then they he'd go out and you know the 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 guy says oh you do this in turn one and you know you'd either make it or you or you just hear this almighty bang (laughs) and smear it all up against the wall scrape him off and send the and send the next guy out and it was just you just don't get that today you know but back then it was just unbelievable to see that and, and we had Doug Bowles on here, and I think we were talking actually off camera ap- after the show, but that was, you know, at a time where the fuel cells were larger, uh, the cars would be heavy, you know, on the back, and then the, the weight transfer would change a lot, and the speeds on pit road were different. I mean, it was just a, it was a wild, wild west. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the, the pit road was so rough back then, and there was, there was no speed limit. I mean, you're... Uh, your wheels were off the ground about four times coming into the pits and your feet were bouncing off the pedals and, and you know, you got the, uh, the guys on the side here with the signal boards you know, and you got people getting, uh, uh, you know, tires changed on the other side and, and you were just flat out, you know, it was, it was incredible. When yeah. did you realize the magnitude of that place? I, I never knew that was your first time there, was your rookie year. Yeah. When, when did you look back and go, my goodness, what a special event this uh, is. I suppose when I walked out onto the grid, you know, and the crowds there, it was just, even though, you know, back then the, the qualifying day had big crowds also, but it was, it was really just walking out on the grid or on the on the race. Was, did it have an F1 feel to you? Did it, did it bring you back to maybe your father racing and it had that same vibe? Well, I had enough problems of my own to, at that particular <laughs> time to worry about him. <laughs> Yeah, just uh, just just that vibe with all the people you know surrounding. Uh, wow! So if you think back in your career in those four years where you won the championship, or or maybe the five hundred, or maybe in cart, whatever it may be, is there a driver or a couple of drivers that stick out to you that you just constantly battled with? It seems like you'll get a driver somewhere along in your career, and it's like a magnet to that person, and you just duke it out your entire career. Um, not particularly. Um, it, uh, you know, I, I when my IndyCar career, I was running against the Unsers and Andretti's and, uh, and and all those guys. Um, uh, I mean, I never sort of respected anyone more than anyone else. You know, as far as I was concerned, it didn't matter who was driving that car in front. I was trying to pass it. You know, but uh, um, I know I, in my IndyCar career it was a little bit frustrating because uh, I had like six second places, but I never actually managed to win a race. I was going to I was going to bring that yeah, up. You were yeah. so close so yeah, many times. Which was yeah. really, really disappointing, really frustrating because I had opportunities to win and something would go wrong. And, you know, during my career, uh, you know, I drove for some good teams, but it, at, at the particular time I drove for them, they weren't at their peak, you know, so it was, it was a difficult time for me. And I know uh, you're saying particular drivers, uh, every time I came second, it seemed like Mario won the race. And then every time Mario broke, I wasn't in second, you know, (laughs) but uh, yeah, it was, it was frustrating, but um, you know, it was, it was great to be there. And it's something I I look back on and, and Hey, there's not many people can say they run, you know, 10 Indy 500s and ran for eight years. And uh, it, it was 
it was a, a good time for me. Yeah. What was your favorite form of motorsport? What was your favorite car to drive? If you had to choose, if you'd look back 50 years ago, what, what would you say? I want to get into this car and drive it again in competition. Um, yeah, probably because Indy cars at that time, we, we had a new car every year, you know, so it's not like today where the same car basically every year. So, uh, but the car that, impressed me probably the most was the Peugeot that I won Le Mans with. Um, that car was just, you know, fantastic. You know, we had a, a V10 F1 motor and uh, we were actually a little bit slower than the Toyotas. The Toyotas were just marginally quicker than, than all us Peugeot. They had three Peugeots in the team. We had to run flat out. It was like every time we got in the car, it was a sprint race, you know, and, um, uh, the car just, uh, I think we replaced one tiny little bolt in the rear wing the whole race. And uh, it, it was just incredible. And the downforce and, and the team. And it was uh, uh, Jean Todd was the team manager. And it was his last race. And he went to Ferrari with Michael Schumacher, you know, after that. And uh, the thing that, step, you know, I, re I remember most about the whole event uh, uh, was that John Todd, changed the rotation of a driver so I could finish the race. And uh, I'll never forget, you know, uh, I'm indebted to him to allow him to do that because coming across the finishing line in a French car at the Le Mans 24-hour race w was something I'll, I'll never forget. Because actually the crowd had come onto the circuit and I only just made it across the line. I had to stop because there was just people everywhere. Yeah, it, was, it was crazy. But, um, yeah, it was a pretty special moment for me. Can't think of a better place to uh, to wrap things up than crossing the finish line at the 24 Hours of Le Mans as a driver. Uh, man, goosebumps here. That's uh, one of some great special stories. And, man, what a career you've had. It's just been fabulous. All right. Thank you. Been an honor having you. Yeah, right. thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Brabham. And keep your eyes on his up-and-coming son. He is a talented driver. Thanks for joining us here at The Skinny. Thanks for being with us here on The Skinny. This episode has been brought to you by Toyota, Rhino Classifieds, Dream Giveaway, and General Tire. For the latest in sunglasses, optical frames, accessories, and apparel, be sure to check out fatheads.com. That's fatheads with a Z. Production facilities provided by Fatheads Eyewear Studios. All rights reserved.